Hi, everyone. I'm David Lang. I'm at the Open ROV headquarters in Berkeley, and I have Andrew Quitmeyer here. Andrew, where are you located right now? Howdy. Right now, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia at Commingle HQ. And the, uh, the weather looks pretty good there. Oh, it's gorgeous. I'm out on the front porch enjoying all the, the pollen we got everywhere and all the leaves and all the blooming everything. It's great. So I don't want to. I don't want to um, try and and give the introduction. I want to know what do you what do you describe yourself as? And so you're a researcher. You're you're a citizen scientist. How do you how do you identify? Yeah, uh, it's tricky. I would say the core of what I like to do is I like adventuring and I like going out and being in nature and I like. Um, exploring the avant-garde of technology and art. And so I, know, I would say digital adventure. That's what I, I'll tend to, to go by. Um, but yeah, my, my goals are I just want to be out with nature, find new things, and then also invent new things. That's my goals. I, I think that's noble. I like that. But you are, but you are also an academic. So you, you, you yes. told me that you're working on your dissertation right now. What, are, what are, where are you studying? What are you studying? Totally. So I'm a PhD student over at Georgia Tech, and I'm in this great program called Digital Media there, uh, where it's kind of like uh, humanities, uh, traditional kind of humanities approach for looking at how digital devices of all sorts uh, can be used in new ways and. What I particularly look at um, with my research at Georgia Tech is how can we use everything that digital media is able to present to us uh, to help scientists explore nature. Interesting. Awesome. That that's uh, is it's funny that you call it di digital naturalism because everybody I know who comes across or who's working in this area calls it something different. Some uh -huh. people call it science. We've called it connected exploration. Some people call it uh, the postocalypse. Some people call it extreme science, extreme citizen science. And I, I really like digital naturalism uh, too. But it's funny because we've, it seems like we've all come across this idea that mm -hmm. these tools for exploration and science and conservation have all of a sudden gotten really cheap and modular and something that anyone can actually play with and get their hands on and that it's worth experimenting with. And nobody really knows what it means, but everyone's kind of hitting around the same idea. Exactly. Um, yeah, we're all kind of funneling in from a lot of different areas, and then kind of meeting the same nebulous core to figure out what it is. Yeah. And so one of the things uh, that I also really like about this kind of movement is there are fantastic stories. It's not just uh, the tools; it's also the adventure and the and the romantic idea of it all. And I don't think anyone has done that quite as well as you have. And so you guys just got back from a trip. Can you tell us about that trip? Yeah, totally. Um, so we most recently went on this trip to Madagascar. And this was with uh, me, um, Hannah Perner Wilson, who's a kind of fancy e-textile designer, really amazing craftsperson and badass adventurer. And uh, Brian uh, Fisher. Uh, who's the head entomologist from the Cal Academy of Sciences over in San Francisco. And so we put together this uh, mission where we went to Madagascar and the biological mission was because there was an ant that was accidentally discovered there that was never been uh, described in scientific literature. And so it was this unknown ant that was kind of accidentally collected by this French expedition in the 70s. And nobody's right. been recorded as actually going up to this mountain since then. So. Brian discovered this ant in like the the annals of some um, museum, I think the Field Museum in Chicago, years and years and years ago. And so, like for 15 years, he's been wanting to go to this one particular mountain and try to re-hunt for this ant. And so, this was the culmination of all that. And so, then along with the the biological goals, um, I came along with my research, and I used this as kind of a test bed for my dissertation. So, my dissertation is about finding design guidelines that can help uh, engineers and technologists make technology 
that better suits the values and uh, the goals of naturalists, of ethologists, of people studying animals and animal behavior in natural settings. And so that's the goal of my dissertation, but what's the point of coming up with these goals if you're not going to actually test it out and evaluate it? So that's what uh, I use the, the Madagascar trip for. So I came up with these kind of framework of ideas and then we tried it out. And so things that we tried out were like building digital devices entirely in the wild. And so we set up a jungle maker space, built work tables out of woven sticks and vines and used uh, butane powered soldering irons and just tried to make all the crazy devices we could while we were out there. God, that's it's was such a joy to follow along with your updates on Open Explorer because they were always surprising and always interesting. And the you know, even from the preparation of what tools do you bring to the the handwritten notes that you sent us from the jungle and then the artwork and everything you created afterwards, it was always a joy and I never knew what to expect. Um, maybe maybe talk a little bit about that. What um what for you was the biggest surprise in this whole this whole trip? Oh man, there's just so many surprises that it, yeah, it's hard to figure out maybe like a biggest one. I would say in general, it was I had been doing lots of work in Panama. And so for me, you know, I'm coming from I'm I'm a guy who really likes adventure. Um, and I've been spending the past three field seasons of my dissertation, which you know, nominally is in like a technology school and my program does a lot weirder things with people who do art projects about graffiti and digital media and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But you know, in general, it's, it's a lot more tame and I'm the one going down to Panama and you know, encountering deadly snakes and all kinds of stuff like that. And so I was like, okay, well this is pretty crazy. But then we get to Madagascar, it's just a whole nother level of craziness. And you know, we're not, we are so many days and so many types of transportation removed from even the closest, you know, uh, electrical outlet you could think of or from a hospital or anything like that. And so it was terrifying and thrilling and just the, the like, I'm on the side of a mountain and we need to get to the top of this mountain. And the only way to do that is to climb up this waterfall. And so that's what we're going to do, even though it seems super scary and crazy. And then you find out you're able to do it. And that was, that was probably some of the most surprising things for myself. <laughs> wow. So, you know, that's it. My friend Ariel Waldman, who runs uh, this project called Science Hack Day, mm -hmm. did, a science, did a science hackathon hack day in Madagascar. And Ooh. her big takeaway, what she told me, was that she was shocked at how hard it was to get just that many Arduinos there, that they, they just weren't available there. And that was actually a big challenge, actually just getting yeah. these devices there. And is that something that was surprising or true for you? I know you guys packed them all. Yeah. Um, oh, no, it, it like, it super was. I, I really didn't know anything about Madagascar before I'd been there. And, you know, another thing of like, where I went from like a smaller country like Panama, where you know, I had, I interacted with the locals and we hung out and stuff and, you know, you encounter, there's like some serious poverty there, but then I get to Madagascar and it's the first time I've been there. I didn't know anything about it. And it was just this whole nother level of extreme poverty that I had just never encountered my entire life. And the people that we hung out with and interacted with and hiked with, you know, the, the, the rich pe person in a village would be the person who had like a metal knife. Um, and that was probably like the most, you know, expensive thing that they had. And so we're showing up with all this strange future gear um, that, you know, is very rare in Madagascar. Um, and so that was kind of a strange feeling, but it was also kind of nice because we were able to donate these, all this stuff to like start up kind of a little hacker space uh, in Tana in the capital of Madagascar there. Um, and so we have this, this great guy, Haran Jaka, who's, who's trying to, he's already using a bunch of the tools and kits that we left for him. And they're starting up a little hacker space with some uh, French funding that's coming in now. So hopefully we can just kind of foster and seed this. Um, yeah, that sounds great. I mean, that, to me, that's something that, that was surprising for me in this whole process is, okay, 
that's great. The tools are getting cheaper. We, we mm -hmm. can see that. We can see that with, you know, we've done that with OpenROV, but, you know, Foldscope is another good example. The, the microscope, the origami microscope, they cost 50 cents. Um, you know, to us, it was, it was, we wanted it because we, we didn't have any money. I mean, Eric and I were building this in his garage and we just yeah. needed it low cost. And we thought it would be a good tool for people like us, people who were amateurs and had different ideas about what they wanted to do, uh, didn't have big NSF grants. But one of the things that surprised me has been uh, how good of a tool this has been for researchers in the developing world. People who, cool. you know, they're, they're scientific, you know, these are really smart, bright, curious um, people. And they are, they're, the problem is just their their institutions haven't had the resources to acquire some of these tools, and OpenRV has fit in really nicely there. Yeah, yeah. When and, I was giving this stuff to Haran Jaka, he was like, "This is great. We have all these people lined up who are trained in electrical engineering and all this stuff, but they don't have anything to do electrical engineering with." Um, and he's like, "Now we can, you know, actually, you know, start messing around with stuff." Um, so that's it's terrific. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really encouraging. I, I, when, when I think about this whole thing, this thing we're talking about, citizen science, uh, digital naturalism, whatever it is, uh, mm -hmm. to me, that's the most encouraging part, is that it's not just amateurs. It's not just, um, but it's also not just researchers in the developing world. I also think it's uh, something, I, I, you know, the postdocalypse, all of these researchers who are, you know, studying things, but maybe can't get access to, to something in their lab. So they try this on the side and they use these low cost tools to prototype these ideas. I think what it, what it's doing in general is just lowering the barrier to pursuing a question. If you have a question, the barrier to, to pursuing that answer has just gone down. And, and that is really exciting. And I don't think that people realize that it's happened yet. I don't think it's an well, obvious. Yeah, I think I think one of the important parts, um, and especially for me, and the whole reason that you know I call my work digital naturalism is because I am building off these this more romantic side of this uh, ethological science that was developed in like the 1800s and 1900s uh, uh, that kind of was ag pushing against just like this very strict empiricism of like much broader, bigger technologies. And what I've started seeing is like you were saying. Uh, having this cheaper technology at, lets people kind of formulate and quickly just ask and address their own questions rapidly. Whereas at the same time, we have this like really amazing, uh, super high end technology that's incredibly expensive, like million dollar uh, DNA um, analyzer machines and stuff like that, that let scientists um, answer um, and ask these really specific questions. But then you start seeing this kind of split in science where just in order to ask this one question, you have to be part of this lab and you've already invested, you know, a million dollars in this machine. You have to start feeding this machine. Um, whereas with, you know, maybe these simpler, cheaper tools that you can still kind of craft your own, we can also reclaim some of these kind of earlier naturalist ideals of uh, just, you know, playing and being inspired by nature to then ask questions and kind of iterate on these very simple questions that just haven't been explored. So that's the part I look at is this, like all these little bits that are still just super ripe for exploration and not as much uh, the like very deep exploration that some of like the really expensive high-end technology is going for. Like there's not gonna be a, a DIY uh, large Hadron Collider, you know? Well, um, you know, maybe not maybe anytime be. soon, but maybe maybe in the future, and that'll open up these whole new worlds for people to like, like me, to be like, what? What if I want to find my own bosons or whatever? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so every time we go out on one of these expeditions, we always have an idea of, of things we want to learn, mm -hmm. and every time we go out, we come back with a slightly different idea. A slightly different take on that question and we're always excited to, to pursue the next iteration what for you is the next iteration of these hiking hacks of this of these jungle maker spaces what what's next um, well one immediate one thing that jumps out immediately is uh, when Hannah and I were, were out there 
uh, we started really thinking about kind of the meta structure of these jungle hiking hacks. Uh, so the original hiking hack I ever did was last uh, summer in Panama, where the goal was I got a bunch of my scientist friends and some other people who applied, and the goal was, okay, I've been doing workshops with the Smithsonian uh, in this kind of laboratory next to the jungle for a couple of years now. What mm -hmm. if we just cut the laboratory out of this? And so like, let's grab everything we can, put it in our backpacks, hike three days into the jungle, and just see what can come out of this, see what we can make. And mm -hmm. so that was great because it taught us so much. You know, everything failed, uh, and we got there, and we, we were still able to build some things. But a lot of the infrastructure that we hadn't even thought about, like, oh, you know, it's much easier to build something if you have a surface to build it on. We were just kind of like trying to solder things in the dirt. And so while I was there with Hannah, um, in Madagascar most recently, we had all these other ideas for building up this kind of meta infrastructure of like, what do you need in order to more easily um, build and create really cool things while you are completely separate from um, the, you know, the regular modern conveniences. And so, whereas originally we had just been thinking, well, we just need solar panels and power and butane and we can build anything we want. But now, um, you know, uh, she's starting to, she's making these really gorgeous uh, portable hacking workspaces where it's kind of like a messenger bag or like a backpack thing you can toss on. It completely unzips and you can hang it on a tree and it has all of your um, conductive threads um, already in like little areas you can pull and snip off. It has all your tools organized. It is a gorgeous, brilliant idea. And so we're working on building up infrastructure like that of, you know, maybe a deployable uh, work table that can hold itself taut, um, that, that's also not going to melt if you accidentally you know, drip solder on it. Uh, things like that, and things that we can use the environment to help support us and lighten our load. Uh, so those have been some of the, the really cool things. I love that, I love that idea. That's really, I, I, I we found that too, is, is that there very much is this need to go meta a little bit. So we started with these underwater robots, but then we realized that well, we kind of need a way for everyone in this community to share what they're doing and where they're going, and that's what Open Explorer grew out of. It's really, it's really, uh, I think, a natural thing to to start doing this and realize that there are bigger holes that we actually need to fill first. So yeah, that's cool. And that's one of the cool things about when you do these very specific projects out in nature, you discover these huge gaping holes in like the infrastructure of the world that don't really exist. That you're like. Oh hey, this is open, you know, to explore and work with too. Um, that's one of the my favorite parts about all this. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I've described it as as feeling like we're on the edge. Like it feels like true exploration because we're on the edge of what's possible, and yeah. that really is a thrill to to be there and to say, "Wow, nobody knows what happens if we do if we try this or we do this," yeah. and we can do it. It's thrilling. It can be also very frustrating at times. We sure. just like. I just want this thing to work. This is my whole goal is for this to work, and then it fails. Yeah. But then you end up like you know, two days after that, after you're really frustrated, you're like, oh, we came up with all these other ideas though on the way to this one idea, which totally you know fell apart. <laughs> well, I think that's the importance of documenting all of this. I, you know, everything we do and everything you've been doing is we. I think we've tried to do a really good job of documenting, so that um, we can all learn together. So we're not all necessarily making these same mistakes that we're actually getting yeah. smarter together. Yeah. So what, tell me about the next uh, uh, hiking hack you guys are about to, to go on. Yeah. So the very next hiking hack that's coming up is the, it's technically the wearables hiking hack. Um, so there's a big uh, wearable technology department at Georgia Tech and I applied for a grant from them to uh, basically design technology that fits on your body um, and it's kind of, our, our goals for this mission are, are twofold. One, take existing wearable technology that lots of other researchers have made, like dancing equipment, um, you know, different kind of eye-mounted things like Google Glass kind of stuff, whatever, um, and take them into the woods and push them to the test and, you know, see if we can break them. Uh, so they have lots of different stuff that needs to deal with very harsh environments. Like they have this uh, dolphin microphone thing and that thing's really robust. Uh, but some of the other technology they're building this wearables department, uh, you know, it could, it could use some, some, some beaten up. 
So uh, we figured the forest is a good place to, to push any technology to the test. But then... That, mm -hmm. that sounds amazing. <laughs> but then the second part of this is going to be what can we build um, with the wild and inspired from things that we find in the wild uh, that we can also wear and you know have embodied interfaces for interacting with all of the, the surroundings and things like that. So uh, we'll be... Those, those will be the goals we have going on there. I'm so excited to follow along. Are you guys going to be documenting this on Open Explorer so we can tag along? And yeah, so it's going to be kind of tricky because um, in Madagascar, we were able to have the funding where we had this satellite connection. Um, right. and even though in Madagascar we were much further away than we are now, we're not sure we're going to have any kind of data link while we're out there. We're going to go on some pilot trips. Um, in two weeks to see what kind of like uh, data coverage we can get in the places we're going to be going, um, yeah. but it may be like a collect and then post, uh, uh, cool. you know, share the expedition, which works good. That's cool. That sounds great. I mean, I, I'm just yeah. Either way, I, either way, it's going to be great because there's yeah. so much to learn. Yeah. There's so much. I'm so interested to, to see how these things go. I think there's so many question marks, and that's that's exciting. Yeah. Cool. Well, I um, I don't want to keep you too long, and I also don't want to make this too long for for viewers who might want to catch up. But we yeah. should uh, maybe do this again, and Unbelievable. after your your next hiking hack, and see what you've learned. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Andrew. Take care. Have a great no day. No problem. Great chatting with you as always, David. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.